So with that, our uh, presentations today, we're going to start off with, uh, with Eric Hill, and he is going to present uh, about securing the software supply chain and critical warfare assets, and this is going to be around cyber. The, uh, the next presentation is going to be by a company called Q Markets, and this is someone that we're going to be teaming with to build a messaging service for our community. So, so basically the goal is to, to be like a popular business to business messaging service that is in existence now, but to be around, focused around innovation and non-traditional technologies and, and companies and also underserved communities and, and businesses. And then the last one is going to be, be Ron Kennedy, and he's going to be talking about, about uh, floating shipyards and, and a, a Corvette warship that they developed a concept for. And I want to highlight here too that, that even though Ron calls them shipyards, they're scalable. So they could go all the way from a UUV platform or a quadcopter platform up to a shipyard that can work on ships at, at hundreds of meters. So with all of that, I am going to turn this over to Eric Hill. Go ahead, Eric. Now, yeah, now Eugene, do you, do you in this format allow questions during the presentation? Yes. Yeah. So if anybody has any questions during the, que the presentation there, you know, open, open, raise your hand or unmute and, and, um, or I'll actually, sometimes I will. Yeah. Please, please, please do auto do audio because I, I, I pull off my second screen because of, um, no, I don't, I don't want people to do it in the chat because we want those open interactive conversations. Exactly. That's exactly. where we come up with the aha moments. Perfect. Perfect. So everyone feel free to ask, this is a conversation. When I originally present, when I present this uh, on base, and just so, so you all understand, I, I've used NATO as a medium. I do publish white papers. I do, um, I'm an advisor to certain groups. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, if you're a small business, I have no problem with informally reaching out to me and helping you understand what I'm about to discuss. This informally, I view it as a national security issue. We're discussing this before we even broke out here. So let me see if I can get to the share. Um, there we go. Too many different formats I deal with daily. Okay, window. Can y'all see that? Yep, I can see it. Excellent. I can, yep. All right, excellent. So the title of this uh, presentation is Securing the Software Supply Chain for Critical Warfare Assets. This was first presented at NMIOTC, mm -hmm. uh, the NATO base in uh, Suda Bay, which is, uh, US has a Navy base there. There's several other NATO facilities and there's a, there's a lot of interaction happening, especially right now. I'm, uh, we have special ops stationed there uh, in the U.S. side, et cetera, as well as uh, our, our allies in Greece. I'm going to walk you through this process. And what I like to do when I update, uh, especially the military, my military associates, is what's happening in the U.S. as a thought process, what's happening in terms of uh, recommendations, mandates, and timelines, and then some high-level uh, guidance uh, from me as someone who's engaged across domains and in the different areas. <clears throat> So I had published the year before. So when I returned, um, I, I presented this as a continuance of the previous two presentations. And what had happened in February, 2023, I, I read media uh, constantly. I am engaged as a practitioner. So I'm not just reading, I'm actually engaged, advising and, and low level technical. Uh, paralyzed at the pier, uh, shortages fleet and systematic naval cyber compromise. And I should point out anything you see in here in the white paper, which is in the NMILTC journal, I have all the references cited at the end. You can actually go online and pick that up. Consider two adversaries who have both compromised the software supply chains of the conventional forces of the opposing side. Each is faced with uncertainty regarding what forces will and will not be impacted at the point of initial aggression and therefore face an incalculable risk toward the respective chances of success. So I want you to think right now what's they're calculating around Taiwan and our Navy and adversaries. In addition, what's happening right now, as I mentioned, if you follow me on LinkedIn, the tactical edge for cyber, yes, it's at the kinetic tactical edge, but it's actually in the homeland here. So our critical infrastructure is that tactical edge also, not just uh, naval assets. Another article, March, 2023. A new cyber resilient approach for war fighting platforms. And you will uh, see soon where the title of this presentation had come from. 
Uh, our nation's critical warfare assets, such as the Arleigh Burke class destroyers in the AES weapons system, AWS, which I've had the honor to advise uh, the latter team on some of these capabilities later on I will cover, are uniquely difficult to protect from cyber attacks. They are examples of large systems of systems running multiple concurrent mission threads, presenting vast numbers of threat surfaces that include complex integrated systems, satellite communications links, sensor fusion platforms, and many human machine interfaces. And if you're engaged with the military at any level and you follow what's happening with what we call JADC2, or rather CJADC2, in a eloquent uh, paragraph, that was just explained. So we're in the midst of this, not just with the US or allies and the most cyber, the least cyber hardened asset in a configuration like that is your weakest link for an attack surface into the mesh. Uh, then an insider, uh, July 31st, 2023. And remember, I, I actually, as Eugene knows, I was in Greece at this time, uh, civilian on the ground. Uh, and I think on the 31st, I'd actually flown into Athens from an island where actually Homer, Homer uh, wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey many thousands of years previous. Officials found Chinese malware hidden in various uh, U.S. military systems. And by the way, the FBI made a release last week. We're in a very serious situation in critical infrastructure as part of this campaign a year, almost uh, nine, about eight months later. Unlike previous attacks, experts say the intent is more likely to disrupt rather than to surveil. Now experts say this new wave of malicious code has the ability to disrupt U.S. military and civilian operations. Last month, Rob Joyce, the director of cybersecurity at the NSA, called the nature of this malware really disturbing. If you if you go back to the white paper, I actually opened up. Um, we are in the age uh, of so we are, we live in a software-defined world, and the battle space of Ukraine has shown us we live in a world of software-defined warfare. So I want you to think about that as I move forward from here. Uh, I understand, Eugene. Right. Sure. So on, in your white paper, did you address any hardware issues like hardware Trojans? So this is this is the interesting thing. I, and I just had a conversation a day ago with an associate who, so I'm a computer engineer, those that don't know, I understand hardware extremely well. I have found as the years have progressed, a lot of software people don't really understand hardware. I, I, they'll use the terms when they're dealing with AI GPUs because it's a buzzword, but they truly don't understand silicon. So if you look at the efforts mm -hmm. that have occurred, they're separating out software, firmware, and hardware. And while I don't address uh, hardware vulnerabilities in here, there are methods, and I haven't seen them implemented in commercial product as of yet, but there are methods that apply to uh, precisely hardware in here for hardening. In fact, I actually was, um, 2021 had proposed at a much, a very large company, the concept, the DOD is talking about a software factory configuration. I've been talking about a secure silicon factory configuration prefab using similar technologies that map to the uh, semiconductor space. So I don't address it directly. They're, analog they're uh, uh, analogous uh, tooling. Did that, I know I took a little bit longer, but that answer that question? Yes, it did. Thank you. What I did, what I opened up in the briefing, and I was running through this much quick, quicker because I'm in front of many militaries and I'm interested in introducing the cost. You have to understand, you can't assume they all understand our classification system. You can't assume that they've mapped it out and everyone in the room understands it, including stakeholders in academia and if they're in the maritime the civilian sector, but they have the same concerns. So I want to break this out because I'm talking about special access program facilities, which are air adapt uh, facilities. So, uh, Classifications of the DOD, when you hear uh, confidential, secret, or top secret, that's classified. Another category, uh, controlled and classified information. This is data you don't want linking. So if, for instance, if I pulled down a slide deck, I'm not supposed to distribute it. So it's not classified, but I'm still not supposed to distribute it. Um, so this is kind of an important distinction. And I, and for the purpose of this presentation, consumer top, you can assume we're talking about secret and top secret, although I do work with folks in environments that are air gapped. Uh, I do know the financial sector uh, in particular, they don't have uh, classified systems because they're purely private sector, but they do treat things as uh, private sector secrets and they do have air gap systems. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask, you can come in after. As this is a Navy presentation, uh, I wanted to pull off uh, a place map that the Navy had been out, uh, placed out there and give some context. If you ever heard the terms Nippernet, net and then impact levels. 
I've annotated uh, NipperNet here. This is basically, if you think about it as the, the military's internet, if you hear impact level four, impact level five. Uh, secret is CIPRNet, special ops unit. And you know, of course, we have another classification uh, loosely referred to IL-6+, plus, which is for JWIX, uh, the intelligence community. But I, either way, this is just to give folks context of what we're talking about, but we're gonna fall back out of that context and we're gonna be talking, just think about secret and top secret for uh, the sake of the air gap system. And the big conversation, uh, d zero trust. So you have CISA has their zero trust maturity model. It maps to this model loosely. Uh, folks do work together uh, across these different areas of the government. The uh, DOD has been trudging ahead and you're gonna see next they actually have a funded timeline. The capabilities I'm talking to, uh, the security gate capabilities exist in that applications and workload pillar. However, uh, because as I mentioned, we live in a software defined world. In fact, we're talking to DOD, software defined warfare. There's a play here in every pillar because all the software that defines these pillars have to be hardened. If they're not hardened, we're doomed. Mm -hmm. And this here is a roadmap, a DOD zero trust strategy. So if you know how the DOD is structured, you have the domains. The domains have had have variants on how they're going to stick to this, but this is the general guidance on what they're going to map to for rollout. I know some have lagged. We just got through a CR, which a very long one, which caused some chaos. I've heard folks say we're still on on for this goal of 2027. We'll play that out, but now we're at breakneck speed to get these um, capabilities in. But if you see that document, it's on the DoD CIO's uh, website. It is an open website. Mm -hmm. You can these docs. This is a timeline. The capabilities that I'm about to speak to sit in this grid. And this is a page with several other uh, rectangles. On. In August 2023, uh, and again, this presentation was in September, uh, strategic intent to implement zero trust from the U.S. Navy. And this is a maritime conference. And our domains have se slightly separate lexicons. In fact, they have a different terms for JADC2 even. And even their uh, briefings such as this that roll down from DOD guidance are separate. So here, the program executive office uh, announces their strategic intent to hit that goal that I just mentioned and laid out in that previous timeline by 2027. So they officially laid down the gauntlet and said, we will do it. In addition, uh, October 4th, 2022, uh, the U.S. Navy had come out with their RAISE 2.0 platform, rapid assess and incorporate software engineering. If you go through the document, you will see they call, they call it a DevSecOps platform. And that no doubts about it, if you're ever in any of the discussions or briefings, it's a software factory platform. So there even, I heard an informal discussion of even renaming it, but nonetheless, this document is also available online. You'll notice these gates. And, and part of what I wanted to do was simplify this complexity. So to dual use technology. So SAST is a well-known tool, although not a lot of folks don't know how to, how to use it yet. They're, go, they're going to have to, uh, that, that maps directly. But it calls out, must provide secret keys dis detection in this requirement. Well, I happen to have worked with SaaS tools that do this. So in my guidance, I said, if you have a SaaS tool, you may be able to just simply map this to do secret keys detection. If your SaaS tool su supports that, you're good. You don't have to buy another capability. Where you see the term software bill of materials, uh, provide container security scanning, that's the industry term SCA, software composition analysis. I became concerned when I started seeing the DOD documents come out. They mentioned SBOM, uh, dependency management, the three terms are generally oh, vulnerability management, dependency management, and SBOM. Those fall under the private sector term of SCA, but that didn't start appearing until about this year in official documents. So I was trying to help people understand how these map. Uh, dynamic application security testing. These are going to be attack vectors that you're pounding your software before you release it. And you're going to see this in a diagram in a little bit. <clears throat> so what we're mapping here, uh, those, those uh, categories of capabilities, SCA, SAST, and DAST, I'm mapping them to Lexicon from MITRE. MITRE does a wonderful job. Uh, the scientists there in the groups, it's what I always like to do. When I architect things and when I have discussions, it always maps down to a basic lexicon and then you map back up and make sure you're consistent. So here, what's important to understand when you're applying software composition analysis, one, you're actually <clears throat> scanning binaries. You're not scanning ASCII code and it's third party open source. So you're getting uh, intelligence data from those binaries that 
are going to be in the National Vulnerability Database. And usually vendors will have their own edition of Intel. Some are better than others that actually allow for uh, much better uh, forensics and understanding of what you need to do for your next move with that software, updates and whatnot, even AI-driven advice. SAST, you apply to your proprietary codes. So if you're using open source in your life cycle, you want to make sure you're scanning it with SCA. But if you're typing code or putting in ASCII code, you're using a SAS scanner. SAS is for CWEs, uh, common weaknesses, weakness enumerations. And these are actually automated. They're read out by these scanners. Some are simple, very simple scanners that do basically text reading. But the, the best ones are actually modeling your code in memory, going through code paths, and actually identifying CWEs to the developers and other stakeholders for them. In DAST, Dynamic Application Security Testing, you're actually uh, pushing attack vectors onto your software. We call that a KPEC. So keep that in mind, CWE, CW, CVE, and KPEC. So for a KPEC, you're testing for known CVEs or possible vulnerabilities you don't know exist. This is why I have two, two arrows here in this diagram. And when you find CWEs in your code, they always map, not always, they, they will sometimes map to vulnerabilities. If you're building a weapon system, if you have a CWE, you're doing a lot of reporting because you're not supposed to have any and definitely not a CVE. But those, that's, there are some ways to get around that, but those are, those are mitigations that are supposed to be in a timeline taken out. So understand that a vulnerability, a weakness that may be a vulnerability, and a KPEC where you're exposing vulnerabilities. And you're going to see this in a software factory layout. Uh, Eugene, how much time do I have? Just so I can cadence this. Um, so you have over right around 15 minutes, a little bit more. Perfect. I took okay. almost 10 minutes of your time. Perfect, perfect. So I just wanted to make sure you understand in the background here, this is actually a DOD dot diagram. It's from the DevSecOps strategy guide. You can pull it down from the DOD CIO library. I've annotated in red. So I just went through those capabilities. I mapped SCA to the Navy's RAISE platform, our RMF platform. I actually mapped it to the lexicon for MITRE, CVEs, CWEs, mm -hmm. and KPACs. And now I have it laid out in an ecosystem for building software. I want to run you through a, a really simple use case, uh, actually a couple of use cases. I'm a developer in an IDE. Uh, I will have a uh, situational awareness delivered by a uh, SBOM heat map that tells me, hey, uh, you, can't, you need to actually change this out before you do a, a pull request into your Git repository, um, which is what this code repo is. And you, you, you're given uh, decision points on that using your SCA capabilities. What you'll typically be doing as a developer is pulling down open source binaries from these known open source repositories. No longer are you supposed to pull from Bob's open source project because we have our friends everywhere in North Korea and China actually running campaigns, hoping you will do that. And they've actually invested in campaigns on these open source repositories. So for the sake of providence, the DOD is pushing you to only use these for new software uh, using open source. So again, to repeat, a developer uses a technology to pull software in from a, a repo, which is basically a proxy mechanism. As it pulls from the source repository, <clears throat> there, will, there will be a policy check. If it doesn't meet your policy, it will actually quarantine it in this repository. This maps to CISA guidance, and I should say CISA and NSA guidance, but also what you wanna do in a software factory configuration. Uh, so you're actually quarantine anything that doesn't meet policy. If it does meet policy, you're actually going to take that code, you build your code, and you can, keep in mind, you're always going to have iterations of this, but let's assume you're doing your pull request. Typically, these providers of SCA will actually be able to, in an automated fashion, inspect your use of open source on the main branch and the developer branch and issue guidance uh, as it's automated. So this would be, these are phases where SCA ties in uh, to your life cycle. And now you're actually going to be going into your build phase. So when you build, you're going to hear talk about scanning uh, the build and breaking the build. At the same time, uh, you're also going to be doing a SAS scan. So when you say scanning, it's a very overloaded term. In the context of these technologies, you're going to hear it used, but they're very different things. So in terms of SCA, you're going to be scanning binaries, SAS, the actual code, and DAST, you're actually scanning running software with attack vectors. So let me run through Eric, this build. Yeah. So where where does the um, 
the optimization and hardening come in at? Because a lot and of these, yeah. a lot of those local ones say that they harden, they're they're pre-hardened or, or it never optimized. Is. Exactly, exactly, and that's the whole point here, right? So this this hardening occurs throughout the life cycle, and even after you release, you could have vulnerability until like log for shell. If anyone was around for that. You would have had software that was released for a few years, and all of a sudden, if you had an SCA package that was good, stakeholders would have been notified right away, and you would have known exactly you had that in your software. But that software would have been out there, and you were notified of a national security vulnerability <laughs> within a day. This came out, I think it was Christmas, it was it Christmas 2021, I believe? Um, I believe that was 2021, yeah. So the, the whole point here is this whole process is cyber hardening. Nobody... Nobody can guarantee that your software is cyber hardened on release. It's a con that's why the push for continuous authority to operate, where you're maintaining cyber readiness through this process on an ongoing basis, and it's even going to be tied into your contracts. Did that answer that question? Yes, it did. Thank you. So I'm going to run you through this build phase really quickly. I'm a developer with my open source binaries. I did a design phase. Only your manifest is checked in to your code repository with your proprietary code. I go to the build phase. My uh, first thing I'm going to want to do is scan my ASCII code. And depending on what language or, or, or package, it could change a little bit the order of operations. But let's assume I scan my ASCII code here. You could break the build because using SAST, as outlined by the DOD, uh, you get a CWE that you do not want. And it says, hey, you got a problem. Your developers have to fix it. You're mm -hmm. also going to actually do your build uh, and pull down your binaries at that point. And once you have your binaries down, you're going to scan them with your SCA tool. Now, what does that mean? So remember, the SAS scan on your code tests for CWEs. So it's going to take those that code into memory, model it, and tell you if there's a weakness. The SCA scanning identifies your open source and if there's new vulnerability intelligence that came in. So if Log4Shell came in before you did the build, right here, you're going to fail the build. If it came in uh, before you tried to pull in uh, your open source, the developer code is open for source, it would have been quarantined. If it came in while they were developing, they would have had situational awareness on posture and or on your check-in, you, you would have had actually um, kickback saying, hey, you've exceeded posture, we have new intelligence coming in. So here we're assuming now you have a, a new vulnerability intelligence that you didn't account for in the beginning of the cycle that tells you, hey, posture's exceeded, go back and fix, fix this. Interestingly enough, uh, if you talk about the Java world, uh, any of these technologies, actually, in the, typically you're going to be trying to switch to, not always, and I'm aware of the situations, why not, but let's talk about container images on a technology called Kubernetes. So we're, now we're going to build in this stage here, uh, staging a uh, container image, OCI compliant. You're still going to do the same thing with SCA. You're going to scan it, get your SBOM, and posture it. Now, if you look here, uh, you're going to apply DAST. And with DAST, remember you're you're using Capex against that software. So you you've got your posture again in staging. Your attack you're launching attack vectors Capex at the software. Assuming it passes, you're going to go to the next stage and cut a release. If it doesn't pass, you're going to go back to the developer phase again and stakeholder decisioning. Once it does pass, you're actually going to take your final uh, scan for SCA, make sure it passes posture. You're going to cut your S bomb. Make the S bomb available with all those definitions uh, in a Cyclone DX or uh, SPDX format. And this is what, what the DoD is looking for. So I just anyone wondering about these requirements, this is what they're asking for when you hear software, secure software development framework. Um, you're going to make the S bomb available along with all of your software artifacts. So if it's either depending on your layout uh, on that side, it's either a push or a pull from this repository. Nonetheless, that software is ready. What I've done up above, you'll notice, I took the RAISE platform, and I don't expect you to understand this here because I threw a lot of numbers at you. I mapped that, that mapping I did a few slides back to this DOD DevSecOps software factory. So it's a very simple mapping for folks to follow when they go through RMF. Any questions before I move on to the next slide here? I'm gonna look at this a little bit differently. All right, same technologies. We're gonna look at it a little bit of a different way. I've simplified this massively. But DAST, we're going to look at in the software factory. So I'm, I'm not deploying it outside. This is actually the tooling itself. So I have SCA I'm utilizing across the software factory, SAST in the software factory, and DAST. But they're being deployed in the software factory. 
as container images on Kubernetes themselves. So think about that. Now I've changed to an architectural context. I have a DAS provider that's giving me a container image, a SaaS provider that's giving me a container image. And with SCA, here's the trick. It's always the hardest to get into these special access program facilities because you have tons of vulnerability intelligence that maps to tons of open source. So you're definitely going to have, I've simplified this to a container image. There's actually going to be several container images with, with each technology. Let's simplify it. So there's one container image. The differentiator for SCA, no matter what, is this massive amount of data and the vulnerability intelligence. So just if you remember that, you're doing good. So Eric, GG yes. again, sorry to keep interrupting you. But um, so yeah, a lot of people are interested in, in copies of these and uh, prob probably more details on, on how to uh, how to go th so, through this process. So I, I can provide you this deck uh, gratis from the um, from the um, nonprofit that I, I'm associated with also. That's kind of why I did it that way. And then my white paper is actually published. You'll get more depth. And I have references uh, on the back here. And I actually uh, have, have more, I believe, on the white paper. So definitely can provide all that. No problem. All right. So you, if you wouldn't mind then, after your presentation, if you could put a lot of that stuff in the uh, in the chat, yeah. links and things like that. I okay. think that would be a great benefit. Sure, sure. Uh, air gap. So I wanted to use a NIST definition. So we're talking about special access program facility, which inherently is an air gap. So I want to give it a formal definition. An interface between two systems at which they are not connected physically. And this isn't necessarily true nowadays. We're moving more and more towards virtualized air gap, but that's a different discussion. And some of you may be aware of that, but keep in mind I'm intentionally using a very specific definition. Any logical connection is not automated, which isn't true today in air gaps, because I'm very well aware of using data dynos mm -hmm. and automation technologies, but we're going to assume this definition about what we're going to run through. So to lay out our technologies, uh, air gap uh, software factory, you have the cloud to the left, an air, a literal physical air, air gap a little bit further uh, east. You have uh, the vulnerability intelligence for SCA and its container image, SAS container image, and a DAS container image. So I'm, I'm applying all those definitions. You're looking at it through a different lens. And the use cases for getting these technologies across the air gap, the initial install, container image release updates, and your daily FOSS vulnerability mm -hmm. intelligence updates. And remember, number three only applies to SCA. So to give some color here, uh, if you ever heard of SneakerNet, I'm using that as an example, and there are very, far more advanced ways to do this. Believe it or not, I'm using a solid state drive example. I know people that are still doing uh, disks, and I don't mean uh, uh, hard disks. I'm talking about burning disks, <laughs> literally walking them across. So that we still have even lower, lower maturity there than this. But this is a simple explanation where you're going to pull all these artifacts I just mentioned for the use cases, typically off the internet, onto a solid state drive, or at least an uh, analogous entity wheel it across and we're going to get it in the air gap and we're going to let it let it install you'll notice on that initial install we're moving the container images to their kubernetes install bases this is what k8 represents but also because inherently with with the vulnerability intelligence you're dealing with data you've just compressed data to make it fit on the uh, solid state drive and now you need to etl it extract transform and load into that vulnerability intelligence for that initial install now, also keep in mind, uh, ETL is going to apply for those daily uploads. Container image release updates. So if you're just doing updates, and typically it doesn't even matter if you're with the same vendor, uh, typically the, the SCA, SAS, and DAS capabilities will be out of sync. I happen to know today, typically uh, they're going to have multiple vendors for these anyhow. And not only that, for to make it a little bit more complex, for weapon systems, you're required to have two SAS scanners. So that's another implicit simplification I made. Nonetheless, you're going to take those images, walk them across the air gap, and use the technologies already in the facility to update those Kubernetes installs. And number three, the most important, because you don't want to get caught where national security concern, wait a week or a month, and sometimes you can have malicious code uh, actually be activating, uh, FOSS vulnerability intelligence update. You're going to pull that data down. You're going to walk it across the air gap and you're going to ETL it. This is typically a daily activity. If you don't have a daily update, you need to question your vendor because you need daily updates to make sure you're getting this latest intelligence so people in the special access program facility are notified when there's a posture uh, posture being exceeded because they, they are people dealing with these systems that um, are very uh, vulnerable if we don't take care. There are major repercussions. Um, 
if we don't uh, if they don't have the latest intelligence. So now what do we have? If you look at what I did, I walked you through a use case, so I don't need to do it again, but I have all those capabilities in the software factory. I should comment, I assumed there was a strategy to bring the open source repos in. On, on, on one end, you have folks that will bring, have, have strategies to do that. There are other strategies involved, but for this simplified white paper, I, I assumed that there was a strategy to bring these open source repositories, Maven, uh, NPM and PyPI across the air gap on a frequent basis. Now I was actually gratified. So I actually had presented at NMILTC 2021, 2022 and 2023. Uh, during the year, I was in a briefing and I found out the Navy, I, I had a very specific uh, recommendation I did in a certain write-up. Uh, some were business confidential that I released the DOD, so you're not going to see them outside. And one was at uh, NMIOTC regarding ASOC <clears> tools. <throat> and folks doing uh, raise, that raise 2.0 at platform are using an ASOC tool. I know that for a fact, and I was happy to see. When, when you see some of these recommendations being utilized actively, it's uh, very gratifying to know you help put things <clears> across the line. Uh, application security and orchestration uh, tools for analytics and automation. These actually help you extract what you're doing. So when we talk about that lexicon of CVEs, CWEs, and CAPEX, those all map to metrics over time. And each domain is working what those metrics and KPIs are going to be and what they mean. But you, you need a tool like this to actually sew those capability uh, capability data together. And uh, to conclude this, I think I've... I've um, done well on time, uh, securing a software supply chain for critical warfare assets. Just, this was just meant to dip this in, especially these small companies that have been probably mesmerized by all this, these requirements being thrown. It's not that complicated. Sometimes can take 10 minutes to help you decision. I'm hoping this actually helps you decision, accelerates that process because you are going to have to do this. Uh, understand the basic concepts of data classification, uh, security gates, software composition analysis, software application security testing, and dynamic application security testing, CVE, CWE, and KPEC. And again, if you work with the Navy, those are the base security gates. You saw that in the RAISE requirements. Uh, <laughs> SCA, SBOM, Vulnerability Intelligence, OSS, et cetera. That's where that maps. And RAISE is a US Navy software factory platform that maps back to the DOD effort. Uh, ASOC tools are an accepted way to calibrate the software factory. Uh, basic challenges of the air gap software factory. And again, I kept this extremely basic and simplify the complexities to build secure software for critical warfare assets. I've noticed this trend, and I know I said this probably approaching 10 times, I'm very concerned about these innovative SIBRs having these requirements, and they don't need to be ridiculously complex. There's technologies out there <clears throat> using these keywords. You can actually apply them in your life cycle and move you a long way. And with that, uh, Eugene, thank you for the invite, and I'll open up any questions, comments, et cetera. Hey, no, Eric, thank you. Thank you for coming in last minute. Great presentation. A lot mm -hmm. of information there. And so I'm going to go ahead and open it up for questions. Anybody you're muted if you're talking? I, I will also, also to repeat, if any, if you feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I, I, I give guidance all the time to folks off tilt. And again, I'm not looking for a contract. I don't ask for money on these basic things. This is actually a national duty. So I, don't, I have no problem with you reaching out to me. If you don't ask a question here, you don't want to raise your hand publicly, no problem. Feel free to reach out to me. I'm on LinkedIn. Eugene's linked with me. I'm involved with starting up uh, FCA chapters right now. Felicity, you work with a lot of people. What's I your thoughts? Oh, sorry. I, am I on mute? No. No, you're no? good. Okay. Um, sorry. What was the question? I, I literally had someone pinging me on Teams um, about some sort of fire for soft week. So <laughs> um, <laughs> what was your question? I'm so sorry, sir. No, I, I was just asking, this is Eugene, I was just, you, you work with a lot of different companies, so I was wondering your thoughts about cyber. About and, Eric's presentation? And, and Eric's presentation, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I was actually taking some notes and actually texting a number of people in my ecosystem who I think would be very, very interested in this. So um, have been an active participant of this, even though I'm um, uh, doing lots of things at once. So that's actually why I asked if the deck would be available afterwards. I'd love to be able to send this around. Um, and sorry if I missed this. Are you? Um, where are you in terms of company um, mature, like you know, um, maturity? Like, are you in like raising any rounds, or are you looking for investment? No. So, so I, if you go to LinkedIn, you'll see I do work at a company. I picked it out when Long for Shell hit, but I I work in the community. I'm a stakeholder. At the, so <laughs> so there, I was in Greece when I was when Gene participated in the panel. I was doing with a nonprofit. So I I I do travel. Some people go on PTO and go to Mykonos. I go to military bases in Europe. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> Got it. Love it. Um, will you be at Soft Week for a chance? I, I, I'm actually in Orlando. Um, so it's not hard for oh. me to, if you want okay. to have a discussion in the evening. My son actually goes to USF. Um, so I'm, I'm in between the ecosystem. Totally ironically, I, for the yeah. company I'm at, yeah. they bring, although Intel sought me out last time. So it's, it's kind of an interesting discussion. <laughs> uh, well, perhaps if, if you're, if you're, um, I have some folks in Orlando for Geo and, and, or if you're, you know, want to pop to Tampa, um, I'd love to continue these conversations. I think there's a lot of traction we could have. Yeah. Feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I I'm involved in the ecosystem here. And ironically, I just had a Geo and conversation yesterday. So I, I'm involved with folks in these different areas and I don't mind having a side car. My, my biggest concern right now is we're, we're complexing the daylights out of everything. We're not starting with a simple conversation. <laughs> Yeah, and, and and Eric's Eric's experience is quite broad because you're doing a lot of stuff with uh, you're working with the Tech Grove in Orlando. Is that correct? And I, I know folks there. Yeah, I, I know folks in the Tech Grove. Oh yeah, Grove, Tech Grove. Yeah. Me. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. There, there, there's a lot. I love this ecosystem. There's a lot going on, and because I know what's going on, I'm just I'm really concerned about the small companies with uh, our Same. ecosystem. Yeah how this has happened. So feel free to reach out. It's not a problem. As far as I'm concerned, no one is now we can actually just give guidance and help things move. No, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm I'm also sort of um, you know, pet project is sort of how to support the the emerging tech companies and and so you're you're speaking my language. So I get it. I appreciate your time. Yeah. All right. Anyone else for Eric? Okay. <laughs> well thank you, Eric. Appreciate it. Um yeah, if you if you wouldn't mind putting putting links in the chat so that people have access to them and and I can uh I can put those on the YouTube channel too with the video.